anywhere between 60 and maybe as high as 80% of doctor visits are due to underlying stress conditions. Cardiovascular disease, heart disease, cancer, autoimmune diseases, the stress epidemic is the lives that we're leading. If you dig down into these, the common factor usually is pro-inflammatory hormone activity, disruptive influence on brain chemistry. The more I learned about this vagus nerve, the more my mind was blown away. It is literally what is connecting our brain to our gut. We've tended to think until quite recently that it's all about the adrenals, but actually the musculoskeletal system produces osteocalcin, which is actually perhaps the most important flight or fight mediating hormone. What are the other tools that could help me? Become more anti-fragile and to be able to... I'm your host, Sarah Ann Macklin, and I'm on a mission to uncover the maze of health myths around nutrition and well-being and guide you through my seven pillars of health. Join me on a journey of discovery and connection and pull up a pew for a front row seat to the most exclusive health conversations of our time. Welcome to Live Well, Be Well. One quick ask, please subscribe to this channel. The more subscribers we get, the bigger the guests will be. 60 to 80% of what a medical doctor sees is related to stress or anxiety. And today, sadly, it's often expected that you should be stressed to be good at your job. We all know the drill. Meditation, mindfulness, and good sleep are all key tools in helping us feel less stressed. But despite this knowledge, many of us find it really challenging to incorporate them still into our daily lives. Stefan Schmelich is a tech pioneer and has been practicing medicine for over 30 years with a particular focus on the mind and body. Stefan believes that what most of us living in the economically developed world most suffer with is preventable chronic inflammation diseases, aka stress. And today we find out the importance of the vagus nerve and how it is the biggest indicator to emotional resilience and stress. And so I started asking Stefan, a really important question on why some people stay ill and others recover and thrive. Stefan, welcome to Live Well Be Well. I am so happy to have you here today because we are going to touch upon a very important factor, which is stress and actually tools that we can use to help reduce our stress. But before we kind of uncover this very big topic. I feel like, you know, all of my listeners and myself, as, as you know, you know, we know the drill, meditation, mindfulness, getting enough sleep. But despite all of this knowledge that we are open to, and it's a free resource, um, 60 to 80% of people that go to the me medical doctor, their issues are related to stress. And it can also be such an underlying problem for so many chronic diseases as well, from obesity to type 2 diabetes. So I want to start the conversation from your many years of experience, over 30 years of experience as an integrative health specialist. Why do you see some people who came to you and then thrived afterwards, but maybe some people that came to you and kind of stayed ill and never got better? What is, um, cause that seems to be a big topic of conversation now where some people just never seem to recover. Thank you, and, and wonderful to be here, <clears throat> and uh, a pleasure to share um, our views and my views on why stress is, you know, the the, the ailment of the uh, the modern age. And I, I think you know, if we start by calibrating things, because of course, as you say, everybody knows and everybody hears, and every magazine you open tells you that um, you're stressed and you need to do something about it, and you need to sleep more and various other things. And of course, if it were that simple, there wouldn't be the global problem on the scale that there is. Uh, as you say, anywhere between 60 and maybe as high as 80% of doctor visits are due to underlying stress conditions. In all of medicine, what you realize after a while is it's not really the assessment or the diagnosis of a problem that's difficult. Uh, although, of course, that's what people go to the doctor for. It's the treatment of the problem um, that's the hardest part. And for the vast majority of particularly modern preventable inflammatory type illnesses, the biggest influence on those is the things that we do. So in acute um, crises, um, drugs, uh, perhaps surgery, other interventions can be useful. Um, but we are on the whole living longer uh, than any generation prior to us ever has. But we're also much more prone to get these chronic inflammatory diseases. 
Uh, the two things may be related, but certainly a big part of, um, of uh, the stress epidemic is the lives that we're leading. We're leading lives which no generation has ever lived before us uh, in terms of exposure to uh, electronic and digital devices, in terms of the sheer number of hours we work and how hard we work. Um, it's, uh, it's estimated that medieval peasants uh, worked a much shorter and less arduous day than the, the modern average person uh, and lived a shorter life <laughs> as well. Um, and, 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 just, and actually quite a lot of interesting, uh, apparently small things like the type of light we're exposed to. We could have a whole conversation just about light. Um, and I'll go off a brief, brief tangent on that because I've mentioned that in, until quite recently, all light was red. You know, we had the sun, obviously, and we had torches and candles and um, uh, lamps, etc. But uh, much more recently, in the last few decades, light, we're now exposed to blue light, mostly from devices. And this, um, and this has a, a significant uh, disruptive influence on brain chemistry and stress hormone activity. And... Uh, at New Medicine Group, the, uh, the integrated healthcare team that I founded in, in Harley Street, uh, what we really found was that the majority of chronic illnesses that people have, which are the majority of illnesses that people um, now exhibit, it's not, you know, people aren't really um, getting the kind of uh, plague-like illnesses as much and dying Infectious from those. Infectious diseases. Pe yeah, mm -hmm. people, people um, have problems and they develop over decades and then they eventually cause a problem. So if you, if you dig down into these, the common factor usually is pro-inflammatory hormone activity. So most of the preventable modern illnesses, so from um, uh, cardiovascular disease, heart disease, cancer, autoimmune diseases, uh, diabetes, so um, diseases of um, metabolic, metabolic um, uh, rate, etc., size. Uh, um, if you look into all of these, what you find usually is an under underlying inflammatory action. Uh, just as a brief aside, you know, we um, not all inflammation is bad. We should say, you know, inf inflammation, like all processes in the body, has an important biological and survival advantage. But if we if we um, uh, regard the kind of inflammatory conditions, um, of inflammatory responses that are going on in the body that are leading to these chronic conditions, if we regard those as uh, non-optimal, then then we're moving in the right direction. And if you look at what's causing most of these inflammatory effects, again, it's broad, so there is elements of diet and lifestyle, etc. But a big part of it, and really, really, probably the single largest part of it, is pro-inflammatory stress hormone activity. So disruption of uh, norepinephrine, cortisol, adrenaline, uh, and we also now know from more recent research that actually a lot of the um, hormones that produce or mediate the flight or fight response, the emergency panic response, are actually uh, are amongst other things osteocalcin, uh, which is produced in the musculoskeletal tissue. Mm -hmm. So yeah. we've we've tended to think until quite recently that it's all about the adrenals. And we talk about adrenal fatigue and people are increasingly aware of that. But actually, the, the, our, our physical systems, our musculoskeletal system, produces osteocalcin, which is actually perhaps the most important flight or fight mediating hormone. So and that, that's important because it, it um, points towards the uh, non-biological non-biochemical basis of the solution as well as the problem. So um, physical, that's, that's why we know that physical activity is so beneficial. Uh, that's like why we resistance know training. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, resistance training, um, high intensity, short burst training can be very useful. Mm -hmm. Walking up and down hills is incredibly useful, but also mm -hmm. breathing, humming, uh, and uh, things which get the whole musculoskeletal muscle. fascial network vibrating and humming. Uh, because this then encourages the production of osteocalcin. So, I mean, I my belief very much is that um, the stress epidemic is actually the biggest problem facing the world today. Simply because without sorting that out or having at least a major impact on it, all the other major problems affecting the world today, such as food, um, so lack of food safety, war, famine, uh, plastics, pollution, inequalities. There isn't going to be enough uh, willpower within the human race to resolve those issues. Because what, the, what stress does to us is it makes us look inwards and down. It, doesn't, it, it stops us from looking forward.
And all the major problems we face are, um, you could define them as be of problems of how to be a, a good ancestor, how to follow um, the long path, yeah, how to see the impact of our actions on the next one, two, three, 20 generations. Um, and uh, because we know now, I think quite conclusively, that if we don't start behaving in ways that have an impact on the future, that the um, you know there's going to be major uh, global problems. And while we're focused on a short-term flight and fight and survival, we don't. We that, that's what we don't do. We don't look to the future. And so, I found this fascinating. I really want to go back to the osteocalcium, but before I do. I, the reason why I asked that question at the beginning of why do some people seem to not be as resilient and others do, is there something within the makeup that you just described on why people seem to bounce back from illnesses and seem to just be much more resilient towards stress? Because we all know people that seem to handle stress really well and we know others that seem to really suffer with stress um, a lot more so than others and also tend to have more autoimmune conditions that you just mentioned and other metabolic problems. And, and so from your kind of own experience as a health practitioner, what do you kind of see as the, the understanding of that? I think there's a continuity between all those things, um, between chronic illness, between autoimmune conditions, between allergy, between oversensitivity. Um, they're all really related to the same absence of homeostasis, the, the, the difficulty of your body mind to regulate and adjust. And I'm now very much of the opinion that everybody is traumatized. I mean, we, uh, there's been an increasing recognition of, of, of trauma, um, uh, not necessarily big trauma, PTSD, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, but uh, trauma as a influencing factor on dysregulating balance in the body. And it, the world kind of made a lot of sense to me when I realized actually the world is like this, partly because everybody in it is suffering from some degree of trauma. You know, you, you can't, you, you know, you wouldn't be able to find a community that hasn't been subject to slavery, Holocaust, war, famine, uh, invasion, colonization. There is, there is nobody. Yeah. And again, this, and this is a unique phenomenon of the, the world we live in, where the entire population has some degree of trauma. We also now know from some very good research that trauma passes down through the grandmother's side, actually, for seven generations. So we, so you know, they, so there are still people um, who have been subject to various uh, events in the past who will be experiencing generational trauma, and I think that becomes complex, right? Because when we are very sensitive, hypersensitive, and when we're experiencing extreme reactions to things, but we're unaware of a history of trauma, it can be very puzzling. Mm. Absolutely, but when well, it's we, unconscious, isn't it? It's unconscious. Um, yeah, well, it's, it's 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 why is this happening to me? Yeah, yeah, and and it may you know whereas somebody may have an explanation for that from their own experience, if you don't have that explanation because it's been passed down through the genetic material, then it's even more confusing and disempowering and disempowering and disenfran uh, disenfranchising. I mean, this you know this works on a very obvious way. I mean, if you think about it, you know, you personally were inside mm -hmm. your grandmother's stomach. Mm -hmm. well, inside her ovaries, right? You know, the egg which your mother had was inside your grandmother, right? And of course, it goes actually back further than that. So it's not mm -hmm. actually so hard to envisage how um, uh, descendants and the ancestors that we will have uh, are influenced by the past, but also, but also the way in which we can influence the future. So, so why, so why do some people uh, find it easier to get them um, better than others? Um, some, I think, I think the level of sensitivity one has dictates recovery. So there's genet there's a genetic constitutional element to that. Some people are simply more robust than others. Mm -hmm. uh, some people have simply been exposed to a larger level of um, irritant. Now, whether that means a chemical ir irritant um, in the womb or in, in um, post birth. Uh, in 
pesticide residue, in organophosphates, in, pest, in pollution, uh, in hormonal activity or plastic-based um, uh, uh, hormone activity in water or in food. I mean, there are multiple ways, uniquely, again, in the 21st century, where people can be exposed to uh, chemical and non-chemical um, pollutants. There, there is now no continent on the world, uh, in the world, including the, the two poles that don't have residue, chemical residues in them. Um, but also uh, the, uh, the lifestyles that we lead are also not conducive uh, and, and and there's no blame attached here, right? You know, we we lead the lifestyles that we you know we, we we're all just trying to survive, but the lifestyles we lead are not conducive to harmony and balance. For so many people, it's also sadly not a choice where some people live and a lot of con concrete jungles and things like that. And it's it can be really hard because you know many places don't have green spaces, and we now know how impactful. It is for our mental health and our stress levels to be around green spaces. And I was saying this to Sarah Gottfried yesterday on the show, actually. I was in Patagonia a couple of weeks ago and being in complete wilderness, I felt my stress levels just from nothing else, just from changing my environment, completely full, completely full. You know, my horizon was so wide. The periphery of my vision was so wide, but I was... I barely saw anyone apart from a couple of horses. And being kind of that submerged in nature for two weeks was one of the biggest transformations I've had on my own stress response. Um, but it's hard, isn't it, right? Because you can't all just jump on a plane and go to Patagonia. It's like one of those things of how do we try and regulate an environment that we're around to, to reduce our stress response. Yeah, and of course, you know, we should be trying not to jump on planes uh, as on much planes. as possible yeah um but also i think it's important to be held in the land that you live in mm. um people move around now that's another issue right people move around now much more than any generation has ever done before uh, and many of the people who might be listening to this um in the uk or wherever they might be may not have been born in the uk uh, or may yeah. only have been you know may have been brought here or come here via various mechanisms over one or two generations ago. So, um, uh, so having a sense of place and home can be harder and can be challenging, mm. uh, particularly in a city uh, where disconnection from the seasons, disconnection from the environment, the irony of being surrounded by people but feeling lonelier um, then, then you know, loneliness is a, is, a, is a problem. Um, Huge. Uh, yeah. So we have, but although it's lovely to be able to walk out your back door or jump on a plane and go to somewhere beautiful and stunning, where it's easier to have a sense of awe and wonder, mm. um, there is nowhere really where there isn't maybe even a tree on the street mm. uh, or um, a you know, um, unless you really are. Um, home. Well, obviously, if you're even homeless, you you have access to a tree or a park. But most people have a window that they can put a pot plant on. Mm. And establishing some relationship with the more than human world, yeah, that which includes plants um, and non-human species, uh, is incredibly important. Uh, it may be the single most important thing that all of us can and needs to do because it works on so many levels it gives us a sense of our connection to a world which is greater than our own which is what you experience clearly um, and there is great healing I mean I'm looking out now I'm, you know I, I moved here for a reason um, I'm, and, I, and, I, and I know that's very fortunate but I'm looking out on trees um, last few days when I look up at the skylights, I see V shapes of, of geese flying over and it's and making their noises. And it's, and it's very, very beautiful and very lovely. Uh, and there is an exercise that maybe we can go over a bit later on that um, will help people connect to uh, the more than human world. But even if you can only look out the window at a tree or a bush or a plant, you know, we're coming into spring in the UK and in, in the Northern Hemisphere, things are beginning to go into bud, the leaves are coming up. 
Uh, the I was out last a few, couple of days ago. The um, the camellias are out. Uh, the snowbell the, um, the the snowbells have already been out. Uh, we'll be having bluebells soon. So becoming aware um, and and one of the problems being in the city is it's so easy to not be connected to the seasonal changes. You're probably listening to this show because you care about your health, both physical and mental. That's why I created Live Well, Be Well to share new ways to think about your health. I want to talk to you quickly about something that we all experience, and that is stress. Now, we can all get stressed about a host of things, even the minor things. And stress triggers the primal response. So even simply sitting in a meeting or traffic can trigger this. This brings me on to something called the vagus nerve, and it is incredibly important within the stress response and for calming our primal brains. This device I've been using is called Sensei. Now, it's a wearable touch therapy device. Research has proven that the vagus nerve activation calms the brain medulla responsible for stress and anxiety. Sensei is a device which uses infracell resonance. And when paired with the sessions in the Sensei Companion app, it helps reduce stress and improve overall well-being. In 10 or 30 minute sessions, you can feel an incredible sense of peace, reducing all those small moments of feeling stress or anxiety throughout your day. This device is generally a piece of modern magic and such an exciting step in modern well-being technology. It makes the perfect gift or even better, a self-care purchase. To experience a sense of calm at home, work, or even commuting with your busy lifestyle, just go to getsensate.com and use the code Sarah Ann to get 10% off your first order. I mean, I don't have any grass. I'm very lucky I've got a small outside space, but it's, it's decked. Um, but I don't live that far from a common, but something that I find really helpful is um, walking barefoot on on the ground. I find that really, really soothing. And I have to say, when we were, I'd never been anywhere that was so wild as Patagonia. I think that's why it's had such a transformational shift on just kind of my energy. But I remember our guide saying, I need you to hug this tree. And, you know, all of a sudden you're standing there thinking, am I going to look odd? But actually, when you did it, you really do feel this kind of connection to the earth. And I think kind of being in that in that wilderness, it's something that I disconnect from instantly being in the city because there's so much distraction. Look at the moon, become aware of what phase the moon is in. We're, we're all under the same moon. Everyone in the world, yeah, we all see the same moon. The phases of the sun, because we move around the sun, uh, vary with northern and southern hemisphere. And obviously we have seasons uh, and the moon size, of course, varies. But we all see the same moon. So it's a great, you know, the lunar calendar is also a very good way to harmonize your biorhythms. And to then live, you know, and then to notice the seasons. So when it's cold and dark, notice that it's cold and dark. Yeah, so allow yourself to feel cold or maybe put jumpers on rather than turn the heat up um, like it's summer. When it's dark, go to bed earlier Get up and get up earlier. Um, days can be shorter in the summer, longer in the winter. Uh, like you know, like our, our brains have evolved over hundreds of millions of years, literally hundreds of millions of years, to respond to light. The, the, sun, the red sun coming up in the morning and setting in, in, the, in the evening, and that will vary according to the season. So to, to not be in harmony with that will is a very recent, you know, a few generations. Poss- you know, we, we couldn't, you simply couldn't have done that until quite recently because light wasn't easily available. So, our, so, so in other words, our brains have not evolved to be okay with that. Yeah, it's mad. There's a statistic that I had when we had Dr. Sachi Panda on who works with circadian rhythms and obviously how or circadian rhythms are slightly now off kilter because it's up to 90% of the time that we spend is indoors. So we're not actually getting this natural light to our eyes that you've just been explaining so fantastically. And I think that is one of the biggest kilters that actually kind of throws our body off whack anyway, um, because we are we are constantly stimulated. When you were taking me through and, and all of our listeners through that meditation, something that really came to my mind along with 10 other questions at the same time that I want to ask you is, I don't know if anyone would have struggled to meditate in that. Now, I'm definitely someone who has 
always struggled to, to meditate. Not when I'm in nature. When I'm walking through trees, I feel really calm. I just feel, and, and it's not meditation, it's more mindfulness. I just feel more calm in my mind um, and don't have racing thoughts. If I try and sit at home and I just try to meditate, I find I get really anxious. And for ages, I thought I was a complete anomaly and really odd by this because everyone's banging on about meditation, mindfulness, all of these things, which I am so aware because I spoke about it so much in the show. And for some reason, I, it made me more anxious. Um, and so I'd love to ask, like, why can meditation make people more anxious? And the other one is, which just came to my mind, is that made me feel so good, so calm, so relaxed. It's one of these things that when we're stressed, why do we naturally not go to do that? Because naturally when we're stressed, what most people and myself would do is we might have a drink. Or, you know, we might do something to, to numb it a bit more, as opposed to really drawing into the things that are really good for us. And it just made me think, if it's a natural thing that does calm our nervous system, why do we not naturally reach for that? Um, so that was just two kind of thoughts that I had after, after that experience. I mean, they're great questions, and they're, the, they're the right, exactly the right questions. Um, but uh, again, hundreds of millions of years of evolution, a few hundred years of easy access to anything we want yeah the, the very comfortable lives so we can be hot we can be have as much light we can have as many calories as we want we can have as much sugar and as much fat as we want um, but we haven't evolved to expect that so our emergency response our kind of stress response is designed to give us superpowers in short bursts so that we can run away, we can climb a tree, we can fight, we can get very strong, etc. Uh, and, you know, until quite recently, and when I say quite recently, my children take the mickey out of me because I'm talking like, you know, 300 years ago, uh, but which is quite recently in terms of hundreds of millions of years. But until quite recently, um, we wouldn't, you know, we would only expect to uh, or have to activate that emergency response on a handful of occasions, if ever, during a lifetime. Now, because of the nature of technology, the nature of being always on and the obsession with productivity, uh, these stress hormones are flooding the system almost all the time. So it's like constantly drinking loads of um, strong coffee. You know, of course, our body is completely overstimulated. Um, and uh, it's, it, you, it's not hard to understand, therefore, that one would reach for a quick fix that makes you feel better in the moment, whether it's a slice of cake, whether it's a drink, uh, whether it's sex, whether it's your mobile phone, whatever it might be, something that makes you feel, you know, and that's really what we want, isn't it? More than anything, we just want to feel better. Mm. Mm. Um, and the uh, the solutions which make us more resilient. So with, with stress, you can either um, become more resilient uh, or more anti-fragile, actually, is a much better term because anti-fragility applies to biological organisms, whereas resilience can be applied to a machine. You can make a very resilient machine, but you can only be anti-fragile as a biological organism. So in other words, you become stronger as a result of the stress. That doesn't happen with a machine. Um, so to, to become more anti-fragile and to be able to cope with higher levels of adversity, uh, you that that takes time, yeah. And also, it, and it quite honestly, there's, and there's no way of sugarcoating this. It requires a degree of commitment to being okay with discomfort. Mm. You know, whether it's exercise, whether it's, it's fasting, and I'm not really talking about intermittent fasting, but, you know, calorie restriction, whether it's exposing yourself to cold, um, you know, all the processes, you know, learning to sit still for long periods of time, and long periods might mean 10 minutes uh, in many cases, uh, being okay with silence, which is something we almost never experience, being okay with darkness which is something we almost never experience. 
Um, so there is, so t developing anti-fragility requires a degree of discomfort. In the Arizona biodome um, where they are uh, simulating lunar-like conditions, they have to wire the trees up because otherwise they'd fall over because there's no wind. So they would just fall over. So biological organisms require a degree of something to resist to become stronger. So, the, the, and this is the issue, there's no bottom, there's no, there's no amount of comfort that's enough. Uh, if we become comfortable, uh, we just want more comfort. You know, what we regarded once as sufficient is no longer. And so, so we can always chase more comfort. So the only solution, therefore, to that is to become okay with levels of less comfort. Um, so when, you, when, when we're used to being overstimulated because it's much easier to reach and totally understandable to reach for short-term solutions, when you're then asked to, whether it's with a teacher, with a class, with an app, um, mm -hmm. to sit still for 10 minutes and notice mm -hmm. how you feel, what you notice is that you feel terrible. Mm. That's what you notice because you do feel terrible because you're not, you know for a few minutes at a time you're not distracting yourself with your phone with a drink with a, whatever it might be uh, and the bottom line is that most people when they actually look and become mindful they realize how bad they feel and that's quite scary so there's actually something I I, quote, I, I um, quoted a term um, that I that I've coined, uh, which is the kind of dark side of mindfulness, which is uh, in clinic what I found. I mean, I, you know, dad taught me and my brother to meditate at a very young age. So I've been meditating for 50 odd years. Um, uh, but I, and, I, and I'd used meditation and breathing and uh, mindfulness and all kinds of training with patients for anxiety and depression and trauma for many, 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 many years. But I noticed that people started to become, find it harder and harder to engage with the exercises, people's tolerance for how long they could uh, sit still uh, and not do anything got shorter and shorter and shorter to the point where even a 10 minute app session made people panic. So your experience, I would, you know, I'm, I'm happy to tell you, is actually by far the most common experience. Most people can't sit still and meditate effectively for a, a period of time. Uh, and, and, and in fact, in a way, in an you know, ironic kind of way, the people who are able to are the ones that need it least. So if you can sit still for 45 minutes and, and, and relax and meditate, then you probably don't need to quite so much because you're probably quite well resourced in other ways in your life. So, um, And would you say that those people are more anti-fragile? Yes. They've got more resilience within them, the ones that can sustain meditation for longer and the ones like me that cannot sustain this for quite so long have less resilience or anti-fragile anti fragility. Um, the, the term that you mentioned, um, less so. Anti-fragility, yeah. I mean, yes, but also, you know, let's bear in mind that um, development of anti-fragility is a... Is a a mature a maturity process as well so it's something that hopefully comes i mean everybody gets older not everybody gets elder so wisdom doesn't automatically come with age and experience although hopefully it can and it should um so a lot of people with higher levels of um anti-fragility with greater personal reflection capability have actually been through great adversity maybe including mm. illness or in fact frequently including major potentially illness um so we some people have these this ability more naturally some people have developed it for great um uh, work yeah they've worked on their um, their mindfulness capability over a period of time a lot of people will arrive at it um not by choice but because they've you know, their, their, their life experiences has led them to that place. Sarah, I'm so sorry to cut in, but since Live Well, Be Well is all about health and well-being, I need to tell you what great mental shape I'm in today. Since we started producing this podcast, it seems that you've been on quite a health journey. And seeing you blossom honestly fills me with joy. My sleep cycle's on point. My gut microbiome is in better shape than ever. I'm even doing HIIT workouts. Can you believe it? 
But the reason I rudely interrupted this interview is to tell you about the adaptogenic coffee that you've suggested to me earlier this week, which contains lion's mane mushroom and rhodiola. Two things I personally don't know much about. Perhaps you can enlighten me. Science shows that lion's mane mushroom is known to improve memory, mental clarity, concentration, and overall just your brain health. And rhodiola is a powerful adaptogen known for its effects on stress levels and brain functioning. Okay, that's all sounding very exciting indeed. And I can confirm these shroomy coffees are absolutely delicious. And they come in these single sachets, which is incredibly convenient. But I don't really understand what makes them so special. So what exactly is adaptogenic coffee? The medicinal mushrooms and coffee are probably one of the most perfect pairings. You get all the benefits of regular coffee, which we do love, whilst minimising any side effects. So why does this happen? I know you're going to ask. Caffeine is a nootropic. It increases our alertness and our attention. But many of us will have experienced the increased levels of the stress hormone cortisol, which results in, sadly, the jitters and anxiety. This has 100% worked wonders for me this week. So where can people get them? Okay, so if you want to try these at home, we have a special discount code from the amazing brand, London Nootropics, and they have three different blends to choose from. So listen up, Sam, here is your mix. You can have Zen, it's probably the most balancing. It's great if you're caffeine sensitive. Then you've got Mojo. This is perfect for that natural boost. If you're feeling a bit fatigued, it makes a really good pre-workout because of the cordyceps and also, get this, the Siberian ginseng. And my favourite, to experience the effects of lion's mane and rhodiola, get yourself some of the Flow Blend. We've got a bit of a treat for the listeners, right? A discount code? Yes, we do, Sam. And I know that you love it because you love a discount. So all you need to do is use the code LIVEWELLBEWELL to get 20% off at londonutropics.com. A box of each blend is only £15, so you're kind of getting a very good deal here. And subscription starts at £12 a month, delivered straight to your door. So I found two things from my first question of I struggle to meditate. I wanted to know, you know, what else can I do? What are the other things that, you know, if one thing's not working, you're being told you should be doing this all the time. It gives me a lot of um, calmness to know that you see that a lot. What are the other things and tools that could help me? And I was really surprised. What well, one I was surprised on quite a lot was was human touch. Now there's the other one, which is breath, which is the psycho the um, psychological side, and that was actually developed in the 30s, where they kind of coined this term a lot, and it was a lot about how the exhale was more prevalent to have than the inhale, because that's kind of what calms down the nervous system. And now we talk a lot about breath work. But the other one that I saw was human touch. And there was a study, and I can't remember where it came from, but it talked about the afferent nerve fibers, which basically sends messages to the limbic system. And that can lower our stress hormones. And that's something that has hugely resonated, I think, with myself um, and maybe many people listening um, on how there are so many different varieties of methods that you can use. And what I found really interesting about this study was they were saying, it wasn't, you know, I could touch myself now and that doesn't, is not going to calm me down. But when they looked, it was the, the timing of the touch. So it was the five seconds of the touch, which is normally how mothers stroke their newborn babies to bed. And so it's this natural reflection that they have with their babies. And that's actually what's calming down in, into the limbic system. And I found that really interesting because I think we speak a lot about meditation and mindfulness and we speak a lot about breath work and all of these are fantastic tools that have a huge amount now of scientific evidence behind them. Huge. Mm. Yeah. But the human touch was the one thing where I was like, nobody really speaks much about that, but it's something that I resonated with a lot as well. And I'm wondering if, you know, if our listeners are like, please write in and, and tell me because I'd be really interested. But is that an area that, that, you, that you've looked at as well with, with the nervous system and, um, and stress? We talk about Maslow and the hierarchy of needs. Actually, there's a whole thing that could be said about that. Maslow didn't invent the pyramid. Somebody came along later on and invented the, the Maslowian pyramid. But the idea that um, your basic needs need to be met before other higher needs can be met is makes sense. Um, and I think if we regard the ground zero upon which the hierarchy of needs is built as safety then everything falls into place. So if, if, if an organism 
including us, doesn't feel safe, then nothing is going to work properly. It will produce stress hormones, pro-inflammatory reactions, and you know, eventually autoimmune disease or allergies or whatever it might be is going to uh, develop. So that's why we know from a, neurogen- um, from a, a, a fetal development point of view that touch, mother, uh, parental touch, mother touch to the infant is so incredibly important because it creates within the nervous system a sense of holding and containment and safety. And what is trauma? Um, you know, we can define traumatic experience as not feeling safe. Uh, um, usually based on the fact that we've experienced not being safe in a particular um, situation, or as we've uh, um, as we've said, ancestral lack of safety, which has been passed down to us, which is the more perplexing because we don't understand why we feel the way we feel. Um, so human, I mean, touches uh, c- everything is about connection. Yeah, at the end of the day, and the exercise we did in the in the tree grove was a connection exercise. Yeah, so connect, and we now understand the role of the microbiome, yeah, which goes everywhere. It's in the gut, it's also on the skin, and how that relates to the connective tissue, the fascia uh, of the body. Um, and we know that one of the problems with the destruction of the environment is that the connection and networks and the mycelial um, networks are being uh, eroded. Uh, and that's why it's so important to be in nature so that you can reconnect. And human t- and and then touch with other um, human and non-human organisms. So that includes plants and animals, mushrooms, uh, but humans. You know, of course, every human, unless they, you know, unless there really is a big problem, uh, has an innate need for connection uh, with with other organisms, but particularly with human beings. And touch is, uh, is an aspect of caring or of love or of compassion or of empathy. Uh, and with, without that, it's very hard to feel cared for, to feel safe and to have a positive opinion of yourself. So things like, you know, um, touching ourselves is very important, you know, because shame is such an issue uh, in the West in mm. particular, in, in the developed Huge. world. Um, so touching oneself, you know, and we even talk about you know self care, so skin brushing, etc. Ritual, you know, traditional rituals in all societies where you would go to the baths, you know, you'd go to the sauna, to the the spring, uh, you'd have mud baths, you'd ritually kind of cleanse each other, brush each other's skin, or do it, or doing it to yourself. And you know, every culture has versions of these kind of rituals of self care. Um, and as you say, it's the, the afferent nerves, the, the, the more superficial nerves are the ones that respond to light stroking. And they create a feedback mechanism where one which produces a sense of safety in us. So any way that so massage is incredibly important. Yeah, so what's happening in the brain when that's happening? So when I'm being touched, what is actually happening in our stress response? Yeah, because I think um, that really helps connect to visually what's happening when our stress hormones start to lower. There are notions about what's happening in the brain. Um, I think, uh, I think what we're we're, we're realizing is that the brain, amazingly, is important as it is uh, with its two asymmetrical hemispheres. And again, there's a it's a whole interesting subject there, which Ian McGilchrist talks about in particular. And why is the human brain and the mammalian brain asymmetrical? Uh, we don't really know why, because it's it's unusual and it doesn't uh, it doesn't offer an immediate survival advantage. So it's very strange that it is, but it does also create probably human consciousness. So you know, let's uh, and, and and enables us to be having conversations uh, like this where we wonder about the meaning of things. But the um, I I think what's really important to understand is that we are we have a mind body, at the very least. We, and potentially we have much more than that. So to divorce the mind from the body and the body from the mind is going to take you nowhere. Uh, and in fact, feelings are mostly experienced in the body. So a lot of sense, so the, in addition to the senses we all know we have, there are probably at least 21 senses. Many of those internal body senses like interoception, proprioception, neuroception, which take place um, mostly in the body and the connective tissue, 
uh, more than they do in the brain. <clears throat> Although they are, um, the, the brain is involved in all feelings, of course, but uh, the, the body, uh, a brain in a jar doesn't really experience feelings and emotions in the way that uh, a sensory body does, which is why it's so important to look after and to, um, to, you know, to pay tribute to our bodies as well as to stimulate our minds. Um, so when we're looking at this mind-body connection, which you just mentioned, which I think is, is critical, I do, I do understand how we cannot just be thinking about the mind and we disconnect from our body. It's a very, very famous TED talk, which talks about how we kind of disconnect our bodies from when we start school and it's all, it's all kept into the mind. And it's a really powerful TED talk that I watch. And I, and I think, you know, the more that we're learning over the years, especially with science, but we have still got a specific lens on treating the body in, in specific systems. I think that is something that we're still sadly in the middle of, even though there's a lot more conversation about this mind-body connection. So can you just kind of take us into that next step of understanding the mind-body connection and, and what that really means and how people can actually understand that more? Yeah, I mean, we're moving towards a more holistic view of um, the world and everything in it, including us. So we're still, um, we've benefited from in, in some ways because with the scientific model, but we're also in the West suffering from the division of mind and body that happened in Greece and Rome. Yeah, where uh, um, not originally, but certainly our interpretation was it. You had the arts and you had the sciences uh, and they're separate and you do one or the other, you can't possibly do both. Although in fact, of course, you know, the Olympics, uh, original sports in the Olympics included poetry. <laughs> um, so, Amazing. I would love yeah, to see that today. Olymp Olympic poetry. Can you, can you, can you, I've got the gold medal for poetry. And all traditional societies, Odin uh, was the god of war and poetry. You know, all traditional societies um, uh, value music and love and art and poetry as much as they value hunting or physical prowess or, you know, skill with the sword or whatever it is. And we've become very asymmetrical in our le right brain, left brain uh, functioning. And that's, um, you know, that, that's, that, that's a danger because it means that the body becomes, so the body mind is out of balance. Uh, and, and when the two, the body and the mind uh, and whatever else might be above that are not communicating, then imbalance and inflammation is more likely to occur. So in and this okay. is the this is what's interesting if we look at the east. So in the east, that division between mind and body. So you know, uh, arts and sciences, um, um, masters degrees and arts degrees, uh, psychotherapists and doctors, surgeons and 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 um, uh, counselors. You know, that these divisions we have, which are completely artificial, never really happened. So if you look at Taoism, as Buddhism, uh, they they are systems of mind and body. Yeah, the, the idea that the heart is involved in how the mind thinks and feels is not in any way strange or alien. In fact, it's obvious. And in Eastern cultures, connection to the land and to nature and a, a more... Uh, a process of reciprocity where you don't just take, you don't just extract from the land, you also give back. And you see this in all traditional cultures. And actually, this is my favorite term now for um, modern uh, um, culture is, is, is extractionist um, uh, economies. So that's really the best way actually of describing it. It's, you know, cultures and economies which have grown and thrived through extraction of resources without giving anything back. And we're seeing the repercussions of that now, obviously, in terms of mining, in terms of the sea, in terms of wood, etc. So for there to be mind-body balance, there has to be a recognition of the relative merits of the body and what it's good at you know, moving around, feeling, all feelings take place in the body. Yeah. Trauma is also held in the body. It's not held in the mind. Um, so you can talk about trauma to the end of time and it won't change anything. You need to move it. 
Yeah. So modern developments in psychotherapy are body-based psychotherapies. Uh, so things like somatic experiencing, uh, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's an understanding now that to have an intellectual approach to a feeling is like talking a foreign language. I mean, you are literally talking a foreign language. Feelings are about, about what you feel. You don't think fear, you feel fear. You don't think love, you feel love. So to experience the full range of human feelings, good and bad, that's not a great way of, you know, powerful and, 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 and more powerful, um, then you have to be able to, you have to be embodied. I've been thinking a lot about somatic experiences recently. Can you explain what that term is for anyone who's listening to this thinking, I don't know what, what that even means? Yeah, I mean, I mentioned that one because that, that's something I'm trained in. But um, Peter Levine, who wrote the book um, uh, Taming the Tiger... I think it was Tame the Tiger, um, uh, was one of the first uh, um, uh, people to explore uh, trauma resolution therapy. There's several uh, versions of this available. Somatic experiencing is kind of like mindfulness. It's sort of like guided mindfulness exercises. So you get some, it's not, an, it's not analytical in any way. Um, and it's not trying to make you understand an, on an intellectual level your uh, traumatic experience. It's a nape excuse me, it's enabling your body to process it um, via the nervous system. The theory is that traumatic experience is held in the, in the connective tissue and that when you um, re-enter it and allow it to be released, you'll get tingling, uh, usually in the extremities, and that will, that's actually the trauma processing uh, and reorganizing the connective tissue in the nervous system so that um, you don't get the automatic response to certain triggers that you have been up to that point. I absolutely love interviews like this one, which give you so much useful advice for your own life. And if it's helped you, this is an invitation to join my inner circle. It will give you exclusive access to a host of things, expert written articles, nutritious, delicious recipes, your own members hub newsletter, podcast plus, and also products and discounts decided by me for you. For one very small investment, it will help guide and support your health. If you use the code SAMCOMMUNITY, you can get 20% off your Inner Circle membership. Just head to www.sarahannmacklin.com. It's so funny because we had, um, you've mentioned a couple of times, and I haven't wanted to interrupt you, but about intergenerational trauma and also how that can sometimes be holden in our body. And we had um, Dr. Marielle Bouquet, who's just written a book on intergenerational trauma on the show recently, who was speaking a lot about like shaking and arming and doing everything, even just yourself, to try and release that trauma that can be very held in our body and um, and how much I do advocate ther therapy a lot. I think it can be super helpful, but sometimes there needs to be something else where it is lodged in the body and we need to be able to to move and and feel, which I think generally we have become quite dissociated um, within our within our bodies. There has to be a physical experience. Uh, you, and th that doesn't necessarily mean you have to be rolling around, um, but you have to be singing or chanting or omming or feeling vibration, or m your body has to be involved because feelings are physical. Yeah, they're not intellectual That's experiences. That's a big thing to remember, right? Feelings are physical and it's yeah. interesting. Obviously we'll try to describe how we feel. And sometimes I think, you know, I actually, Dr. Bernard Brown, she talks a lot about we only can resonate with talking three feelings, three emotions, when actually there's over, you know, hundreds of emotions in our body, but we just can't find the ways and the means to describe them. And I think that's such a, a good example of why sometimes we, we lose our way of being able to explain this. Well, and, and, and the role of singing, dancing, uh, and, and, you know, per, this, this is why the arts exist. Yeah, because they are able to express and engender feelings in people that no amount of scientific data is able to do. And so when we're going to this mind-body connection, as well as, and I really want to go into this, and I think this is going to connect to my next question, um, is the vagus nerve. Because if you're thinking about the mind and the body, you have got this integral main nerve that goes in between. I remember learning about this when I was at school for the first time um, at university and being quite astounded by how powerful the vagus nerve can be. Um, and realizing it is such kind of an integrational part of our body that is so overlooked because it is literally what is connecting our brains 
all the way down into our gut. Um, and for, for when I understood it, and even just the nutritional side around it, you know, how we lack nutrition and how this can deplete the vagus nerve and then we can get, you know, brain fog and confusion. But once the vagus nerve is actually reduced so much in these nutrient deficiencies, we can't build them back up. So we can start mimicking things like dementia and all of those things that you might not have dementia, but that's what you'll start mimicking. And the more I learned about this vagus nerve, the more my mind was blown away. And then when you start looking at IBS or IBD and realizing, you know, the bi-directional response that the vagus nerve has, um, it's very, very powerful. So can you talk a little bit about, because I know a lot of your work is centered around the vagus nerve and you've just spoken about oming and chanting, but it is really, to be honest, kind of the master regulator of our nervous system. And can you explain a little bit about the vagus nerve and the power that it holds and why it's so important that we do look after this vagus nerve. And I think that's a lovely way to describe it uh, as a, the master regulator. And I'm I'm uh, delighted that you learned about the vagus nerve in school uh, because... Well, I say my Bachelor of Science. That's when I learned okay. about it. But <laughs> <laughs> because well, for many people, it's still a uh, completely unknown subject. So the vagus nerve is the largest nerve in the autonomic nervous system. Yeah, um, the autonomic nervous system is the sympathetic and parasympathetic branches, and they they uh, it controls all the automatic functions which you don't want to have to think about, like breathing and uh, sweating and heartbeat and all these things that go on blood pressure that go on without you having to actively think about them. So that's great, and we've had a um, we've had a, a, a vagus nerve for eight hundred or so million years. Um, we've had a human brain, what we might call a human brain, for maybe a million years. So what we can see immediately is that vagal activity at the autonomic nervous system level, you know, the neck down, the upper, well, the upper, upper um, uh, lower skull down, is hardwired into our system infinitely deeper than the rational response. Which is why, you know, panic attacks, um, fear, etc. are not related to uh, background or education or intelligence. You know, highly intelligent people can have panic attacks um, because their primitive response, um, and I'm not really doing it any favours by calling it primitive, their essential response easily will overwhelm any rational response. And so, the, yes, the vagus nerve has a physical reality, so it uh, it's the 10th cranial nerve, so it connects into the brainstem. It passes down through the left ear in particular, through the throat, through the diaphragm, through all the organs, <clears throat> right down into the pelvis. You won't see normally it uh, illustrated as going down into the pelvis in the uh, diagrams, but it does. I've dissected it out. Um, you know, branches of it go right down there. So it is also connected to um, sexual function and gynecological function as well, uh, urogenital function but is mostly known for or, or connected with activity in the kind of the chest. So heart to the heart. Uh, it, um, and I, I rather like the term that Stephen Porges, uh, who is the uh, originator of polyvagal theory, um, uh, uses these days where he talks about uh, vagal flexibility or vagal resiliency, um, which uh, is, a, is, a, is a better way of thinking of it, I think, because... Uh, I think that then equates it very closely to what we were talking about earlier, which is this concept of anti-fragility. So if you want to improve a single number in your health, and because we're obsessed with single numbers and data, it's quite tempting to want to do that, rather than be worried about blood pressure or cholesterol levels or heart rate or even something like heart rate variability, which is increasingly um, used, uh, improving vagal nerve tone is the single best thing you can do. Because almost everything we're interested in is downstream of that. So the vagus nerve regulation controls um, much of our emotional state. It controls how resilient we are to being overwhelmed by something. It controls the heartbeat. It controls heart rate variability. It controls blood pressure. As you say, it connects from the brainstem to the gut. So it is literally, when we talk about the um, brain-gut superhighway, we are actually referring to the vagus nerve. So any, any conditions, and when these days that's many conditions, which are made worse by stress, particularly things like you mentioned, IBS, migraine, 
uh, there are uh, many other conditions, uh, the vagus nerve is the single critical most relevant uh, function in the body that controls those. So what can we be doing to help make it more anti-fragile or how can we even know that we're kind of working on it? And, and, and as I'm thinking about that, I'm thinking, well, where do we know where our start point is? Do we know that our vagus nerve is, is not very strong or do we know that actually we're, we're doing okay? Like how can we measure? Do we have any biomarkers? Do we have anything that we can kind of align with to just see where our vagus nerve like overall health is? And then when we figure that out, what can we do to kind of strengthen it and make it more anti-fragile, as you mentioned? Because it does. I love that you mentioned blood pressure. You know, all of these things do come off of the vagus nerve. They do. And so, of course, you can look at any of those individual numbers. Um, and, you know, if, if blood pressure is dysregulated or indeed too low, uh, if hormone activity is very um, dysregulated, if you have symptoms like migraine or IBS, uh, and probably probably the closest um, proxy is heart rate variability, um, which is why people like that. But what people don't say enough about HRV, heart rate variability, is how hard to interpret it is um, and how it's almost meaningless unless you really measure it properly and know what you're doing over a period of time. So it's not, it's not, it's not a, a metric that I actually particularly suggest people um, get into. But most people will have... Uh, and if they haven't, they should seriously consider developing an understanding of how they feel. Most people know how resilient they are. Uh, and they know better than anybody else or that any measurement can ever tell them. You know how much um, sleep you can't, you can, you, you can get away with not having. You know, you know uh, if, how long you can not eat for before you feel strange and weird. Uh, you know how much stress... You can be under before you start getting symptoms. And we are the best measures of our own autonomic flexibility, of our own vagal tone. Awareness is, is the biggest. Developing awareness is, is um, critical to all things, including, <laughs> including being our own personal barometer. Um, but, but, you know, in simple terms, I haven't met anyone who wouldn't benefit from improving their vagus nerve. You know, if we do regard it as the, the mar as, as the master regulator, then of course improving it's always always going to be good, right? So, what would you say are some steps we can take to start working with their vagus nerve? Because I don't think I think everyone who's listening to this has heard of the vagus nerve in some shape or form, but I don't think anyone would have heard of anything to help strengthen the vagus nerve. At all, I don't think many people on this show would have, and I think that's what's really exciting. Yeah, so there's the things that we know from evidence uh, and from research have an impact, uh, and they also tend to be the things which is hard to do. So there's no doubt whatsoever that if you you know meditate for a, you know you do effective meditation for an hour a day over several years, your um, balance and your um, your autonomic balance uh, will improve. Uh, but as we've already <laughs> identified most people either can't or won't do that uh, yeah. exposure to cold humming calorie control uh, in a cal calorie limitation all of these have an impact on improving antifragility and vagal nerve tone human connection empathy and compassion so actively developing empathy and compassion there's a t it's a two-way street right and that's the whole point about holism you know, if you work on the physical side, you will improve the emotional side. If you work on the emotional side, you'll improve the physical side because there is a continuity between both. But in terms of what, um, you know, things that people can actually achieve, um, uh, I mean, the humming uh, in the shower is a great way to start. Uh, <clears throat> By because of the because of the location of the vagus nerve, because of the organs that it passes through in the chest and the heart and the lungs and the diaphragm down into the gut, uh, you have this natural resonant chamber in your chest. Yeah, your chest above the diaphragm contains a lot of air, a lot of space, uh, and it's very much like your speaker cabinet. You know, so um, your the the quality of your sound reproduction in your hi-fi is largely dependent on how lovely your speaker cabinets are. If you've got some, you know, if you bung it in an old tin, it's not, it's not going to sound great. But if you have a lovely um, wooden cabinet, then with, with enough air behind it, because cabinets are, speaker cabinets are mostly empty, then there's the opportunity for resonance. 
yeah, within that cabinet. And your chest is very much like that. So when, and everybody has some experience of humming, yeah? And that's really, in a sense, you know, what omming and chanting are to a large degree. Um, they're uh, within... You're, you're, you're repeating certain patterns because then you're going for a range of frequencies which uh, hit the resonant frequency for each of the organs. But simply humming in the shower, where, where everyone feels safe humming and where it tends to feel good because of the, the tiles, is a, really, um, is a really good thing to do. Wow. And so it's the vibration. It's the vibration of the humming is what you're saying. Yeah. So by using your voice box to produce a a hum, a vibration, the resonance in your chest, which can then echo in and resonate within the hollow airspace of your chest, you're then using the, the rib cage to activate the connective tissue and produce this osteocalcin. Yeah. By vibrating the chest and the bones you're producing this stress-mediating chemical osteocalcin. You're also directly stimulating the vagus nerve and the heart and the lungs and the diaphragm. So, of course, you're um, producing a better breathing CO2, O2 re respiratory response. Um, so that's a really, really good place to start. You know, even five minutes a day in the shower um, is a great place to start. And then to actually... Um, do that in a more mindful practiced way where you actually learn to hum or om or chant um, uh, you know, outside of the shower for five, five, ten minutes a day is, is a great habit. So we've, we've, we've developed a, a technology called Sensate, which does this um, just because I found that even asking people to do five minutes a day of, of, of self-guided uh, meditation or omming or chanting or humming uh, is quite hard. Um, and following an app is quite hard. Um, I was, you know, I was surprised how difficult it is to even follow something like an app because it's, uh, you're basically you're asking your body, you're, you're trying to use willpower to overcome yeah. a physiological response. And you mentioned the physiological size, which Andrew Huberman at um, Stanford has been um, promoting a lot recently. The the uh, the, uh, the breathing pattern where you breathe in and then you. You breathe in a little bit more just to pop the last alveoli and then breathe out very slowly. And if you want a mantra, um, the one that all of us can benefit from is, if in doubt, breathe out. Because I've never met anyone that fails to breathe in, but I meet so many people that forget to breathe out. Yeah. So it is that long, slow exhalation that produces the rest and digest down regulation response as you, because the, the in-breath, the, yeah, you're activating flight, fight, freeze. You're activating, activating muscle contraction. Oxygen uh, activates muscle contractions. Breathing out and increasing CO2. CO2 is not bad. You know, CO2 in your respiratory system is really important. Breathing in through the nose activates nitric oxide, NO, just say no, um, which is an incredibly important cardiovascular relaxant. So breathing gently in through the nose, and you don't need to breathe in much because we're just sitting here in a chair. We're not doing anything. But then the long, slow exhalation just allows CO2 to rise in the body to relax, and then the mind will follow. And generally, it's easier to work on the mind, the body than it is to work on the mind, because the mind will play all kinds of tricks on you, and you can't really always trust what the mind is telling you, but you can always trust what the body's telling you. Mm. So, um, so, yeah, so we use this technology, which um, acts as a voice box, so it creates resonance in the chest, um, the, the Sensate device. Uh, this thing which we've been using, we used in clinic for a number of years and now using with um, uh, PTSD uh, uh, and, and, and war veterans in particular. So it sits on the chest, it resonates, um, you choose a track in the app. And it's, so it does the, it does the, the resonating in the chest for you combined with music. Uh, and that seems to work incredibly well. Um, it seems to produce a very measurable brain hemisphere synchronization and autonomic down regulation in 10 minutes, which is quite hard to do in other ways. Well, it is, because I use Sensei. <laughs> it's the only thing that's got me to sleep like this. And that's why I, after using Sensei, was, and I've always loved the human touch, 
But I am very, I think having that vibration also does create that sense of touch with you. So it isn't just in your mind when you're meditating. And I think that's what the difference is. Also, the other thing that I love about what you've developed is it's really calming music. So it's not listening to somebody tell you to clear your mind, which I find incredibly stressful myself because when I can't clear my mind I'm then telling myself I need to clear the mind and then I go into the cycle and then I think about my shopping or something that's really stressful at work whereas I sensory and I and I feel like many people might connect to this music for me is something that I find stimulating and relaxing but it's a real pleasure and I think when you connect those two which you've done really cleverly you know, calming music with headphones on and also something that is physically you're having to concentrate that's vibrating onto your chest, you automatically start clearing your mind without thinking about, I need to clear my mind. (laughs) That's that's exactly right. So, Yeah, yeah, you you can't use the mind to to control the mind, uh, as Huberman says. So when we're, um, you have to be quite an advanced meditator to tell yourself to relax. Uh, and the problem is most of us will never get to that point because when we try to use the mind to tell ourselves to relax, we'll feel worse. And, you know, a significant proportion number of people do feel worse when they try to relax. And when they notice their breathing, they actually, you know, that's one, one of the best ways to induce a panic attack is to notice your breathing. Um, so, so, so that's one of the limitations of breath work. Again, the, the people that can really work effectively with breath work are the ones that need to use it least uh, because they're not activated by the process of noticing and con- trying to control their own breathing. I use my Sensate every evening um, because I find it the most calmest way for me to go to sleep. Um, but I just feel like I automatically just, it's a bit of a ritual now. It's kind of, it's also, also become a bit of a comfort, but it's something that has become a real ritual for me in the evening because I, I, there is a safety mechanism to it because I know that it induces a feeling of calm, but for anyone wanting to use this, when would you say is the best time to, to start using it and how to, and how to activate it? Because it's interesting. I think a lot of people talk about meditation in the day. Um, but for me, I find it the most comforting to use it actually to switch my mind off in the evening. Yeah. I mean, sleep, um, difficulty is at an all time high, you know, a, a, an incredible number of people find it hard to sleep. We know how important sleep is. Uh, we also know that sleep is strongly associated with ri- ritual, uh, and predictable behavior. So we want to go to bed at the same time, roughly. We want to get up at the same time, roughly. We want to do the same kinds of things before going to bed. So having sensei as part of a sleep ritual makes complete sense. Uh, it's also just in, you know, um, even in short-term use, we, we, you know, people use it for just uh, seven days. Um, one research study we did showed that people were sleeping an hour longer on average per night, which actually, if you wow. look at sleep studies, is an astonishing amount. You know, sleep study yeah, is normally, huge. oh, it's like, you know, se- seven minutes of extra sleep a night or whatever. Um, people were, were falling asleep in half the time and sleeping an hour longer on average, which is a massive amount. Um, because we do need sort of, you know, seven plus hours of sleep. So that extra hour can make all the difference. Um, I also um, like to suggest to people that maybe it's something they can either do on in the morning and getting up, you know, to kind of really give their carpe diem a bit of a kick uh, and to set their, 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 their ability to kind of seize the day and to um, put, put their good intentions into practice. So if you start the day in a mindful state where they uh, as optimize the vagus nerve as possible, then you're going to go forward. You're going to be less tempted by things which are distracting. You're going to be, you're going to be more um, uh, strict about sticking to the things which are good for you. A lot of people also do it maybe at lunchtime. They do a 10 minute session at lunch, uh, which can be lovely because then it helps digestion and it helps um, reduce the kind of post lunch crash. Um, but I think, I think what's important to understand as well is that what we all really want to think about doing is introducing habits and practices which are long term. 
So it's, yes. so it's not just about otherwise, you know, even though obviously meditation is a very natural thing, if you use it like you're, you know, to, to get through your days so that you can then do more, it's not really the point. Well, yeah, a thousand percent. And you've also got to enjoy it. Basically, humans won't repeat anything that they don't enjoy. That's why diets fail. It's why diets fail. It's why invasive or unpleasant treatments, even if they're effective, are not taken up because um, uh, we're, we're, we're designed and programmed to enjoy short-term benefit. Well, I think that's the reason why, and speaking honest truth, for the last year I've stuck to this ritual because I get excited about it um, so much that my partner steals it from me and I it gives me a panic attack. It came to Patagonia with me. It came on the flight with me. <laughs> it's become, it's become, it's, it's, it's become great on flights. It's great on flights. our relationship. Yeah, it is. It's amazing. <laughs> Although it's, I mean, it's hilarious when you unpack it from your hand, like and you go, what's that? <laughs> And it could be interpreted for something else. <laughs> well, we actually had to introduce on, on GetSensate.com, we actually had to introduce a couple's um, offer with two devices because we were getting a lot of people saying, and my, and my partner keeps them taking it off me at night. <laughs> so, now, so now a lot of people have one each. It's amazing how enjoyment and a different side of... I think what you're interpreting, what you should be doing with actually what you do enjoy does stick. And I think it's the fact that it gives you that that music, but also it's touch, I think, that resonates with me. And that's what's resonating with when I use the Sensei device. That actually, it, do, it feels very calm. And I think that is such a big indicator of, as you just said, you know, when you are trying to do something to calm your vagus nerve or to calm your stress response, Make sure you also enjoy it and you're not sitting there for the whole five minutes saying, I really need this to stop because that is just activating a stress response. Absolutely. Listen, we're here. We're here to enjoy ourselves. Yeah. As humans, we're here. We're here to enjoy ourselves. We're here to be good to each other, to enjoy ourselves, to be loving, caring creatures. And um, that has to involve doing things that we enjoy and which other people find beneficial as well. Absolutely. Well, we've got an amazing discount. So I'm going to pop that into our show notes for our listeners so they can go and try it out themselves. Um, but I would really, really, you know, recommend it wholly from the last year of using Sensate, um, that it can be really, really helpful. And something that somebody in my family really suffers with autism and it's really helped them. Um, and I think it's the sensory that's really helped them. And so I, you know, I can understand when you're talking a lot about, I mean, I, I've not got, I've got neurodiversity, I'm dyslexic, but I've not got autism. And I think sensory is so important for so many. And actually sometimes the meditation, as you said, for some people that are neurodivergent, go more into their minds and feeling the panic can stress them out. So this is an amazing device that's also been really helpful to, to someone in my family that's got quite bad autism as well. So I think knowing that these amazing things are out there is, is really helpful. Yeah, we've had quite a lot of feedback from, uh, I'm neurodivergent as well. Uh, I think uh, a lot of people are these days. I think partly increased recognition of the uh, prevalence of neurodiversity, but also again, it's something which is probably increasing because of the nature of the modern world, the disconnection from nature, the uh, the prevalence of technology, uh, it's a real issue. You know, I think I think people who are highly sensitive, uh, people who are neuro neurodivergent, which might be most people now, uh, you know, need to need to act actively do things to calm the nervous system and improve anti fragility, because otherwise the world is a harsh place. And yeah, I really recommend make sure we make sure everyone tries it, whether you're neurodivergent or not. Um, but I thought that was a really kind of good indicator to put in there because I do know a lot of people suffer with, with autism. And, um, and I do know that one of the big things that they use or someone in my family's use is, is headphones to kind of block out the noise. And that's when I automatically thought how amazing Sensate would be for them, where they can put calming music on and, and have some touch. So um, it's been really profound. So just thank you for all the work that you've done trying to create this device. Um, it's been amazing to, to be able to use and so, Stephen, that, that, Stephen, that leaves me with my last question, which I ask all of my guests coming on the show, and I wonder what yours will be. Um, in over 200 episodes, I think we've only had one answer that's similar. So I'm always waiting if there's going to be another one similar or it's going to be a whole new one. Um, so my question to you is, what does live well 
be well mean to you? We're discussing at the moment what, what well-being and wellness means, because um, these are terms that are used a lot and which are poorly understood. <clears throat> For me, I think um, the role of the human being is to enjoy yourself and to have an impact, to leave behind something which will have a lasting impact into the future. So to be a good ancestor and to have a view to the long path. So my steps on this world, in what way will they have an impact on the world in the next 50 to 100 to um, 500 years? So that's the, that's the lens through which I try to filter my actions. Yeah. Much less about me, much more reciprocal. Um, and, to, in, and in what way do, do my actions have an impact on people other than myself? Very empathetic answer, I will say. A very important one, one that I've been thinking about a lot since coming back from glaciers that look very fragile and uh, and realizing yeah. the fragility of our earth now you've got me using that word um <laughs> but it's been amazing to have you on thank you so much and I'll, i'm going to repeat again we do have a discount code for sensate so if you want to use it please do head to the show notes um at getsensate.com and we will love to have you back on for another discussion soon so and it's been amazing to speak to you and um a really insightful conversation all about stress but also how it's not all doom and gloom, how we can actually do something to help support it. So thank you so much for coming on to the show. My pleasure. So wonderful to be here and thank you for being interested. <laughs>